Good morning, Ramblers, and welcome to another weekend, and indeed, welcome to another instalment of Reese Rambles, the official podcast of the Control Alt Reese YouTube channel. I'm Reese, as you probably know. How are you all doing? At least the weather is looking a bit a bit better here in the UK. I don't know if you can hear the birds singing outside the door, but it's nice and warm, and all that horrible rain and wind that we've been having for what seems like an eternity has, has finally has finally abated, and we're back to what should be proper spring weather. So hopefully this is it. Hopefully it's all looking up. But uh, yes, a wonderful, wonderful past week in the world of Reese. I've been really, really busy with the day job. I've been really busy on the channel, I should probably notice. In fact, I'm currently in the process, as I record this, of uploading another main channel video, and that'll be three weeks in a row I've released a main channel video, uh, which is pretty crazy. I'm not quite sure how I've managed to find the time to get them recorded, but uh, evidently feeling super enthused and motivated at the moment. I also got my new dishwasher installed last weekend. Not that um, not that that's relevant at all to anything, but uh, maybe, maybe it's all the time that I'm saving with the washing up is, um, you know, how managing to find the time to do all this other stuff. So the, the video that's uploading at the moment, of course, I don't want to spoil it all, but uh, it is a it is an update on the desk. This thing behind me, which has now taken pride of place in the studio, that desk PC that I did the Doom video on a couple of weeks back, or I suppose it was only a week back now, wasn't it? Picked that up from a, a community center and uh, you know cleaned it up a bit and installed Doom on it as you do. And in this video, I've, I've taken a much closer look at it. I've managed to get into that original hard drive and, and log on as all of the users and, and have a poke through their documents and stuff. And also do some proper restoration stuff because it seems like a while since I've done any proper computer restoration. I, I know it isn't, but um, it does feel like it to me with all the other stuff I've been up to. Um, yeah, so you know the recapping and, and fans and repasting and swapping drives out, and all that lovely stuff that uh, that people enjoy, and that I enjoy, in in fact. So we'll take a quick look at that video, and there's also, there's also something really weird that I want to talk about concerning this video. So yeah, it's still doing really well on the old views. We've got 7,300 views in eight days, so that's really good by my standards, and it doesn't seem to slow, uh, show many signs of slowing down. And I mentioned last week that this had been covered on Tom's Hardware, which is hopefully a website that doesn't need any introduction if you're into all this stuff. One that I've been a regular reader of for uh, quite a while now, and I'm sure you have too. But uh, yeah, well, it's one of those OG websites that's been around forever, isn't it? And yeah, uh, Dave Velociraptor from This Week in Retro, who I will also be talking about uh, uh, again, very shortly, uh, sent me a link to something that he'd come across, which he found quite amusing. And I must admit, it's quite amusing and a bit of a sad sign of the times, really, because that Tom's Hardware article has now been regurgitated by Video Game News 24 or Game News. I don't know what the name of the actual website is. It's GameNews24.com, um, GN24 Video Game News. And this, what this is, is, is some kind of AI a uh, large language model, completely mangled version of that Tom's Hardware article. So it's the, it, and it is, it, it is just a straight copy of that article because the, the structure um, is exactly the same. Um, but they've not linked to the video, which isn't very useful. And they've not linked to the original Tom's Hardware article either. Um, so yeah, it's pretty useless. So the title is, It's unexpected that a salvaged retro desk PC makes Doom and Duron-based system unsurprisingly gives you shotgun blast impers without major issues. What? Um, and then it, it continues. A new list of Windows 2000 computers that can run Doom is an easy but still old source. A very modern desk computer with installed Windows. YouTuber, could turn a lot Continental Alt Reese replaced the drive for DOS and Doom Goodness. The Retro Desk PC was produced by the Somatode Community Center on eBay, where it sold for 30 according to its original video title and accessories. The Community Center had sourced the desk from British PC manufacturer's time. That's true. Okay, that's the first thing that actually makes sense. These people were apparently defunct by 2005, according to reports that they would end up not being in place for it now. There was an extra CRT monitor, no longer needed for the video, a phone-only printer, and even one old computer. Phone-only... I mean, this... I'm, I'm assuming this is some kind of AI thing. I haven't had a poke around the rest of the website, or maybe it's been run through um, some kind of translation thing and then translated back into English. I don't know, but the whole thing is quite amusing reading. Um, I will link, link to it, not because I think it's worth reading, but just because it's so incredibly silly. And yeah, if, if it is one of these AI things, then a bit of a sad sign of the times. But... Um, 
Yeah, uh, thanks for sending that over to me, Mr. Velociraptor. And I should also point out that they have an excellent uh, podcast, of course, This Week in Retro, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I've been on it before as a guest a couple of times. Lovely bunch of guys. Recently, uh, of course, Chris uh, recently parted ways with them, so it's just Neil and Dave now. And a little bird has told me that my desk PC will be featuring on that this week, and that comes out at... Uh, around 10 a.m. Saturday on uh, uh, UK time every week. Really great podcast, well worth listening to. Much better than mine, but uh, there we go. So, yeah, and, and in other news, just before we move on to some actual news news uh, regarding desk videos and all the rest of it, I did another follow-up video. This was based on the back of a couple of suggestions from uh, from some people, and I do explain all of this in the video, but uh, let's uh, let's just uh, we'll hit play on that. Um, this is yet another desk-themed video, and... If, you're, if you think back to the original one, basically what I did was I installed DOS 6.22 on there and I ran Doom and it was all very easy. But of course the audio chipset wasn't supported in DOS because it was a VIA uh, AC97 chipset and they were basically just, they were a product of that kind of Windows 98, Windows XP kind of era, same exact same era of this as this PC of course. And... Yeah, they, they, they were just never supported under, like natively under DOS. People had kind of moved on from DOS by that point, and it was like a low cost thing for Office PCs. And, you know, if you wanted something that worked in DOS, you could go out and buy a Sound Blaster card or whatever. Sadly, not an option in this PC because for a start, it doesn't have ISA slots, it just has PCI and AGP. Uh, but even if I, I could find a PCI card that, that worked in DOS, and, you know, they are out there. Um, the, the, the slots in it are completely useless because of the, the way the case is designed and the height of the thing. So it's not like I could put a, a, another sound card in there anyway. Anyway, what, what I'm waffling about here is that, uh, of course, there is this, there is this uh, SBMU driver and it does support via chipsets. It supports quite a few different AC97 audio chips. But uh, the, the specific chipset in this one, which is the VT8235, I think... Um, wasn't wasn't listed under the wasn't listed on the officially supported one. So I, I was well aware of it. I, in fact, I'd actually watched a video on it um, just before I started working on this. But I, t I took a quick look at it and I thought, well, it's not on the list, so I'm not going to waste my time uh, trying to get it to work because it won't. And it turns out, actually doing a bit more digging, which I, I probably should have done, um, it turns out that they did have experimental support for this chipset, but they didn't have access to that a machine with this chipset in to be able to test it. So what I've done is I've tested it on this machine. I want to test it a bit more thoroughly. I do say in the video that I'm going to feed it back to the uh, the developers, but um, I mean, literally all I've done is, is play Doom for five minutes. So I really do need to test it a bit more thoroughly and just kind of put it through its paces and just make sure everything's working. It's got like MPU 401 em emulation and stuff. So obviously I can hook up MIDI devices and things, do a really thorough test, and then I can hopefully submit... Um, you know, submit that feedback to the developers and yeah, they, they, they can get that chipset on the officially supported list. But just a fun little video really, just explaining SBMU, how, how to get it all set up, how it works, and then uh, just kind of showing it working. And I was, I was really pleased with it. I think it sounds really good. It sounds really kind of authentic to those old Sound Blaster cards. So yeah, that's a, that's a video on the second channel if you haven't seen that one yet. And uh, yeah, let's let's stop waffling about desk PCs and about YouTube and about myself, and let's do a bit of news. Apple, I know, right? Apple. Now I'm an Android user. Uh, I, I've never had an iPhone, and uh, I, I do use a Mac. I, I'm actually currently recording this on a MacBook Air M1 as we speak, and I, indeed, I do all my editing on that machine. So I'm certainly not uh, loyal to any given platform. I just generally just use whatever works for me for whatever reason. Ain't got time for fanboys, but uh, yeah, some interesting news out of Apple this week concerning retro gaming, potentially, and that is that they are now allowing emulators on the App Store. So yeah, apparently, I, I didn't realise this, I guess because I'm not an iPhone user, but uh, yeah, there's no way to uh, officially buy any kind of emulators for old systems on the iPhone or on other iOS devices. And the reason for that is because they were banned, which is a bit odd, um, Apple policy. But there you go, of course, rampant piracy in the whole emulation scene, and that, that's a debate that comes up every every single week. But um, yeah, so of course you could you could jailbreak your, your iOS device and you could kind of sideload emulators on there. But uh, yeah, now it's now it's officially supported and officially allowed and uh, has its official blessing from Apple. So yeah, no no other announcements regarding this though, which is a bit strange. So it's not like they've, they've turned around and said we're allowing emulators. Oh, by the way, we're also releasing this big tie-up with Nintendo or something. And I was having to think about this, and I was thinking that uh, 
Yeah, it is Nintendo that comes to mind, isn't it? Because if you think back, they did actually release, they released Super Mario Run uh, back in 2015, 2017, whenever it was. No, it must have been, it must have been more recent than that. But uh, yeah, it was this Mario game that was released on the iPhone and then later on Android. Uh, quite a simple kind of kind of endless runner type game, one finger control. But uh, yeah, they, they you know they supported it. They, they they've sold extra like levels and things for it, from what I can see. Never actually played it, but uh, it does look quite good. Do enjoy some of the newer Mario games, and of course it's Nintendo. So how bad can it be? But yeah, it does make me wonder because obviously on the uh, on the Switch you've got uh, all of the old SNES games and N sixty four games and NES games and all that kind of stuff. And uh, of course, Nintendo always very keen to sell us all that old stuff that we've already bought a thousand times again on various different platforms, and then uh, yeah, you know, sue people who try to do it uh, without their official blessing, as we have reported on recently. So yeah, it, it does make me wonder, is something in the pipeline or have Apple just randomly had a change of heart? There's got to be some kind of business reason for this. There's got to be something that's happening behind the scenes that uh, will have prompted this decision. But anyway, good news. So maybe we'll start getting some uh, some stuff like RetroArch and that kind of thing releasing on iOS devices. And I must admit, I, d I don't really play emulated games and things on my, uh, on my Android phone, but I do have an Android set-top box. I have the, um, what's it called, the NVIDIA one. Um, and yeah, I do have RetroArch on there, and I, I have been known to play the odd uh, <laughs> NES and SNES game, and uh, played through all the Commander Keen games, oddly enough, using the, uh, the, the DOS emulation at one point. But uh, yeah, so there we go, emulators on iOS. That's my first bit of news for this week. So some Atari news, which should come as no surprise to regular listeners and viewers. Of course, you know I love my Atari ST. And some more news from Jonathan Thomas, one uh, a very impressive developer who has proven it time and again to be uh, very capable, squeezing the absolute best performance out of the Atari STE, of course the enhanced version of the Atari ST, which was released in 1989, and indeed the machine that I had as a kid. And some more news from him, and that is that uh, he's working on a new project. So he's not really released much information about this. I should just say that there is a uh, there's a really good interview with him from back in 2021, talking about some of his previous projects. So he ported uh, Pole Position to the Atari STE, uh, and he's also done a port of Lotus, of course, an amazing rating game, and uh, yeah, L Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenger, or whatever it was called, the full name. Um, he did, uh, yeah, he did um, a really great port. He basically took the Amiga version and kind of took it apart and, and kind of uh, re-implemented like the Blitter code and, and some of that kind of stuff. Because of course the STE, uh, pretty much on par with the Amiga graphically and stuff. It was Atari's attempt at catching up. And, you know, had the hardware, hardware scrolling and, and, and the Blitter and everything else, the enhanced colour palette. But game developers quite famously just didn't take advantage of that. So lots of uh, potential there for people to take Amiga games and, and kind of port them back to the ST, which is a bit backwards um, if, if you know anything about sort of the historical development of these games. And that's what that's what Jonathan Thomas does. Mainly releases stuff on Twitter. Um, that's kind of how he uh, how he uh, releases his news about his projects and things. And he's been showing off this version of. A, a new racing game that he's working on. It doesn't have a name yet. It's just called the Atari STE 50 FPS Racer. And it is, I mean, it's super smooth. It's super fast, obviously, running at 50 FPS. Really impressive looking uh, project there. And you can see it running. Not much to report. There's, there's still quite a lot that he has to implement. It's basically just got, got kind of the main uh, car animation and, and track animation working, but looking really promising. And it's it's fast, you know, it's fast for an Atari ST game and it's it's colourful and it's going to be great. I know it's going to be great because he's a great developer and he's, he's very capable. But yeah, definitely something that... Um, Something that I want to be keeping an eye on. He has been obviously he's been developing this under an emulator, and he has released um, one previous video just showing off the game. But uh, one thing that he uh, one thing that he did discover when running it on real hardware is that uh, there was there's some strange strange graphical things going on, which uh, he's going to have to work on. Not sure if it's a quirk of this particular STE, he says here on Twitter, or inaccurate emulation. Of course, the STEs. Um, Various versions of the DMA chips and, and, and stuff like that. Some of them have issues with hard drive controllers and that kind of thing. It's the nature of the beast. It's this old 80s hardware, but of course he will get it sorted. But looks really cool, looks really impressive. So I will definitely be keeping a very close eye on this. And I will, of course, be keeping you updated on it as well. Might even do a video on it once it's, uh, once it's released. Maybe cover this and Lotus and, and, and Pole Position as well. 
So there was something on my list of potential stories for this week that I'm, I've decided not to cover because it's drama and I, I don't want to cover drama and I don't want to be involved with drama and it's also quite fast moving and there's stuff that's um, stuff that's kind of uh, uh, you know being being on unearthed every minute. So the, the the second you commit it to video, it's going to be out of date anyway. And yeah, I don't want that. That don't want that in my life. It's negative stuff, but. Uh, it has it has kind of spurred me on to talk a little bit about FPGA stuff. So the, 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 this was a story that was con concerning the uh, Mars FPGA project, and I will talk a little bit about the Mars FPGA project and what it is. But I need to put it into context first, and I'm going to do that by talking about Mister, of course. And yeah, so uh, the Mister project has been around for quite a few years now, and is based around is based around an educational board called the DE10 Nano, which has an FPGA chip on it. Now, an FPGA chip, a field programmable gate array, can be programmed to be any other chip as long as you know how that chip works on a, you know, a, a, on an actual logic gate hardware basis. You can turn that into code, and then you can run that code on the FPGA, and it will recreate that logic one to one, and it will be an absolute perfect uh, replica of that chip. So obviously, you can kind of you can kind of see where this is going. If you've got a, a system that's relatively simple, like I don't know, a, a Game Boy or a, a NES or something like that, and you know how all of the chips work, you can uh, yeah, you can describe that in in that language, and then you can load it onto that chip, and it can do an exact one to one repli replica of that console, which is fantastic. And of course, that's what people are doing with the Mister project. So, uh, you know, it, it can run all your old computer stuff, all your uh, Spectrum and Commodore 64, Atari ST, BBC Micro, uh, Amiga, even early PC stuff like early 486 era stuff. It can run, and of course, it can do your NES and your SNES and your Master System Mega Drive, and um, even most recently, stuff like the N64, the PlayStation, and the Sega Saturn, which people were saying a couple of years ago just wouldn't be possible on this chip. Now, I should add that not all of the cores are complete, um, you know, perfect one-to-one -one repl replicas. It also does a, a lot of arcade stuff as well, I should mention. Um, that, you know, not, not all of the cores are, are kind of perfect one-to-one -one replicas of the original chips. Some of them are kind of reverse engineered from other emulators and stuff like that. Um, so when, when people say, oh, FPGA, it, it's a perfect one-to-one -one replica, it's not necessarily. It can be, it can be, and that, of course, is one of its great strengths, but... Um, not necessarily in all cases, uh, but that, that's quite a contentious issue, and as indeed is using the word emulation around this thing. And of course, there's the the analog consoles as well, like the analog pocket. Um, they basically took um, you know the whole concept behind F FPGA and turned it into a proper commercial product, which Mister isn't. Mister is an open source effort. Anyway, so that's all of that. That's, uh, that kind of sums all of that up. Now, oh, I, sh I should mention actually that uh, last weekend I spent quite a lot of time playing with my own Mister, the uh, the Mister Multi System, of course made by Heba, and uh, maybe maybe perhaps made famous by Neil from RMC. But um, yeah, I um, spent quite a bit of time playing with the Sega Saturn core because I heard a lot of reports that there were some issues with it, some compatibility issues, games that had issues with like glitchy sound and and, and stuff like that. So I thought I'd try it out for myself and see what it was all about. And I, I know nothing about the Sega Saturn. So I basically Googled a list of best games on the Saturn and got them set up and got them running and had a bit of fun over the weekend playing with those. So I've also done, I also did a video when it was very first released. I actually, look at this, this is proper old school for my channel. This was two years ago, 11,000 views in two years. And this was me... I basically, I basically got my hands on one of these. I bought it. I paid to, paid my own money for it. But I was kind of one of the early, early trials of the online ordering system that they'd set up and got my hands on it before, uh, before, uh, before a lot of people. There's a good intro in this video, by the way, which explains FPGA and all that kind of stuff, what it's all about. So uh, that's worth watching. Of course, I will link to this. Um, just go over all the stuff that I've already covered. And I uh, basically covered building it and running some stuff on it, including Doom, of course, by the looks of it. Just uh, it's, it's always fun having a poke around my older videos. So that is that. Now, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back, as they say in corporate speak, to uh, the, the thing that kind of prompted all of this and me talking about all of this. And that is the Mars Project. Now, I'm not going to talk about the recent... Um, drama and controversy. It's a project that seems to attract controversy. I think there's some quite outspoken people involved. There's some very, very clever and very capable people involved. Um, but there are some quite outspoken people involved. And I think they've got a bit of a point to prove because obviously they want to be the next mister. 
What this is, is it's a competing FPGA system. Uh, they've got uh, quite a few Mr. Developers on board with it already, kind of porting stuff to it. It's uh, not quite the same concept as Mr. It's basically kind of a complete project. Um, I did spot that Retro Dodo had actually managed to get their hands on an early production uh, prototype of the unit. But the entire point of this thing is that basically it uses it uses a bigger, more complex, uh, more expensive FPGA chip than the original Mr. Project. And the point of that being that um, obviously it, it can uh, it can emulate newer. I use that word again, emulate. But yeah. It, it, you know, it can run newer cores for newer systems. Because, of course, there is an upper limit to, to what the uh, Mr. can do. And I think they found that limit with the uh, the Saturn and the PlayStation and the N64, which is perfectly fine. So this uh, adds, adds um, you know, it's got stuff like uh, RGB and S-Video output on board, which Mr. doesn't necessarily have. It needs kind of external add-ons to do that. Uh, 4K video output, jammer support. I mean, this thing supports absolutely everything. It's, it's kind of taken all of the best bits that uh, people have, have kind of wanted from the Mr. over the past few years and, and that people have developed for the Mr. over the past few years and, yeah, turned it into this commercial project that literally does everything. So it looks really, really cool. There's been some speculation as to, you know, is this is this uh, vaporware? Is this actually a thing that's going to be released, obviously, as well as the controversy and stuff? Um, and the developers, the developers of the project have now said that... Uh, this will be, uh, you know, th th there's going to be a big announcement in June and people are going to be able to start getting their hands on this thing, which is all very exciting, very exciting. So, yeah, I will reserve judgment. I don't want to get wrapped up in uh, people's personal disagreements on Twitter and stuff like that. Of course, this stuff's always happening. But, uh, yeah, just just interesting to see. Of course, quite an expensive option. It's going to cost probably just over double what an equivalent, I say equivalent Mr. Setup, of course it's not equivalent, but uh, you know, a, a complete setup with all the bits and bobs that you would need to get started. So quite a pricey proposition, but then to be fair, you know, if you're running stuff all the way up to, you know, all the way from original 1970s Atari 2600 and, and even before that, you know, ColecoVision and uh, Intellivision and, and that kind of stuff, all the way up to, I don't know, Xbox and PlayStation 2 and that kind of thing, I don't know if it'd do much newer than that. Remains to be seen, I guess, and a lot of newer, uh, newer, newer arcade cores. That's going to kind of a big part of the appeal of it. A lot of arcade machines out there with some weird exotic hardware and, and very fast memory and weird timings and things that don't, don't quite work on Mister. That should be possible on this thing. So yeah, I thought I would. Uh, I thought I would take something that had been in, in the news this week, completely ignore it, and kind of spin it into a bit of an overview and a bit of a look at that, just for anyone who's not familiar with that project. And yeah, I, I don't think it's the first time I've mentioned it in the rambles, but uh, yeah, keeping an eye on this and, and seeing where it goes because it looks very interesting. Now, here's an interesting article which literally just popped up this morning and I spotted it and I thought, that's very relevant to me. That's uh, that's quite interesting. Not really something I'd really considered before. So quite an interesting perspective on something. So let's uh, let's take a dive into this and have a look at it. Of course, on Time Extension, one of my favourite websites. As always, they get featured every week. But I thought this was a really interesting story. So this is about, it's about a Japanese chap called Oliver Jia. Jia? Not sure if I'm saying that right, but uh, has his own blog and he's basically reports on um, kind of Japan in the media, in foreign media and that kind of stuff, and Japan in its uh, on the world stage and how it relates to uh, stuff like that. Culture shock and that kind of thing. Really interesting looking blog. I did have a bit of a poke around this a minute ago, but uh, this specific story is about people buying up games from retro stores in Japan. And it's something it's something I've done myself, of course, and something, you know, I've, I've imported stuff using the uh, the Japanese auction sites as well. And I thought this was a really interesting perspective and a really interesting story because uh, basically uh, he talks about he talks about Kyoto and how foreign tourists are basically raiding all of all of the local kind of retro shops and, and buying up all of the games and the consoles and stuff and then just taking them back to resell them. And he he does he does um you know he does kind of go to great lengths to to stress that he doesn't have an issue with tourists kind of looking around these shops and, and buying stuff if they're going to take it home and play with it but uh, yeah it's the resellers that are kind of buying stuff on mass thinking that they can make a huge amount of money and I've I mean I've talked about this in videos before I've talked about like you know like my uh, Roland mini devices and stuff and how you can pick them up very very cheap and then you can sell them on and, and you can make money on them. And it's not something that I really thought was an issue because I thought, well, you know, this stuff, it's stuff that people have, you know, sold onto these retro stores and it's all just sitting on the shelves and it, it kind of helps to redistribute it to people who are actually going to use it. But um, 
yeah, apparently some of the locals, some of the locals, not so keen on it, kind of all leaving the country and uh, being sold on for a profit, which I thought was very interesting. It's not something I considered. So he talks about uh, you know Famicom Disk System games and PlayStation One games, and uh, yeah, I don't bother shopping for retro games in big Japanese cities anymore. Uh, he adds that his local Surigaya, which is uh, his local uh, local shop, uh, once offered two whole floors of games, but now it's reduced to just one, and that he personally witnessed someone literally scooping up an entire shelf of stock. I saw a guy just taking everything off the already paltry DS shelf. Of course, I've imported D DS stuff myself. I've got, I mean, I've got an imported 3DS there. So, yeah, it's um, quite an interesting article here, really, and well worth looking at. And it's an angle, like I say, it's, it's an angle I hadn't really considered as someone who buys this stuff, as someone who's physically been to Japan and, and bought this stuff, and indeed someone who quite happily and quite openly talks about buying this stuff on the uh, on the auction sites. But perhaps these uh, perhaps these retro shops are being taken advantage of now. Now the uh, the cat's out of the bag, and people know that they can pick up bargains from uh, you know from from Japan and import them obviously a lot of interest in uh, kind of Japanese gaming and uh, some of the roots of gaming over there now in the west and uh, yeah interesting story really interesting story Speaking of interesting stories, it's now, of course, time for my video of the week. And this is a project that I've been following for a very long time. And yeah, it's um, it, it's finally been publicly released. So this is someone I've been a patron of for, for quite a while. And this has been an ongoing project. It's been talking about this for years and putting out little videos and, and snippets and things of this project. And it's so cool to finally see it come to fruition because this kind of combines combines all sorts of stuff that I'm interested in. I mean. Essentially, it's like it's like my day job crossed with my hobby. So it's very much, very, very much uh, kind of uh, kind of up my street. And this is a video from uh, one of my favourite YouTubers called Matt KC, and he does all sorts of stuff. Um, he's probably known best known for his videos about Lego Island and and, and reverse engineering that. But uh, he's done stuff with um, you know PlayStation three and Xbox three hundred and sixty and and that and, and and old Macs and I mean he's covered all sorts of stuff over the years. He's been on YouTube for a while, uh, four hundred thousand subscribers. So. The title of this video is I ported thousands of apps to Windows 95. Now, spoiler alert, of course he didn't sit and port thousands and thousands of apps to Windows 95. But what he did do is he ported the uh, .NET Framework to Windows 95 because .NET Framework was never officially supported under 95. Um, it, it's kind of what I, I generally work with in my day job. I do loads of work with .NET stuff and C Sharp stuff. So I very much know about this ecosystem and how it all works. And yeah, it, 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 that's essentially it. It's a it's a fifty minute long video, so uh, you know, buckle up and uh, make yourself a cup of tea. But uh, it, it is really interesting viewing, and it's so well put together. It's, it's got like all of this. It's got like this this kind of um, side story that's like a whole murder mystery thing that kind of um, it, it becomes all interwoven with the story. It's re really really interesting. It's such a well made video, and the, of, of course the, the actual project itself is interesting. Taking uh, .NET Framework, which of course there's loads and loads of, uh, you know, it's a framework that lots of software has been written for over the years, software and games and all sorts of stuff like that. He's written tools himself uh, for Lego Island uh, that he that he has released um, using .NET Framework. And now, yeah, it, it all runs under Windows 95. I think it's .NET Framework 2. But there's also, um, you know, as a developer, kind of seeing uh, debugging stuff that's, that's never, that wasn't really designed to be debugged and, and kind of working his way around some some very, very old development tools and kind to, trying to kind of push them to do things um, that they weren't designed to do. He, he takes a good dive into the Windows registry, particularly in, in Windows 95 and how all of that works and, um, you know, the Windows installer and how software is kind of installed in 95. And it's just... It's a really good kind of technical insight into sort of Windows 95 and 98, the differences between the two and, and kind of .NET framework and, and that kind of just in time compiling kind of stuff. And if you're interested in software development and you're interested in retro operating systems and retro PC stuff and how that works at a really kind of uh, fundamental technical level, uh, really fantastic video. I know I've said a thousand times that it's a fantastic video and that's why I'm featuring it as my video of the week. But uh, I think this, this one's kind of really kind of above and beyond the sort of stuff that I usually feature. So definitely, definitely uh, well worth checking out if you're interested in that stuff. And yeah, oddly fascinating, oddly fascinating. So there you go, that's uh, I ported thousands of apps to Windows 95 by Matt Casey, and hope you enjoy it. 
So there we go. That's my ramble for this week. I hope you enjoyed this one. Not sure if it's going to end up being a little bit shorter, but I've run out of stuff to talk about. I've also got some stuff to record. As you probably spotted on the desk next to me, I've got a big box of things. Doom related things you may have noticed. I know I'm going to do something else related to Doom. It's going to be on the second channel, just a very sort of quick and uh, quick and dirty video unboxing something. So keep an eye out for that one. Not quite sure when it's going to be out. And I've also just been told uh, that uh, that the office next door is being turned into a full on meeting room. They've moved all the furniture and stuff around in there and they've also blocked my little door off. So if I, I need to go to the toilet in future, I'm going to have to go outside, which is very rude of them. But there we go. It, I knew this day was coming. So uh, yeah, I, I need to hurry up and, and finish this before they all start banging around in there. So thank you ever so much for listening to The Ramble. Hope you enjoy your weekend and yeah, keep an eye out for that desk update video, the Sound Blaster emulator video, the video that I'm about to record and whatever else comes out from uh, from me on my various channels in the, uh, in, in the coming days. Okay, yeah, well, you know how this ends. That's all I've got for you. Bye.